for both of you there, and you can go first, Adam. Uh, did Declan Rice <laughs> look a hundred million pound footballer, less than a hundred million pound footballer, more than a hundred million pound footballer? Um, I thought he was okay yesterday. I didn't think he was. I thought there was a period in the second half where he really took control of the game. I think it was probably between fifty-five to seventy-five minutes, which was probably West Ham. The period of the game where United drifted most and West Ham uh, looks a bit more in control. Um, but actually, I thought Man United's midfield controlled a large part of the game yesterday. Um, the thing with Declan Rice, and I think it's something Roshane wrote about last week, was he seems to be really keen to develop into this driving midfielder who carries the ball, um, you know, a bit like, I think Roshane said in his piece, a bit like Yaya Toure used to do and Patrick Vieira. Um, and the thing that I, that I, and I like seeing that from him, and he did elements of that with England, particularly in, against Italy in the final uh, in the summer as well. The thing that I still don't see from him necessarily is a bit like, if you were to compare him to a Michael Carrick, for example, who was brilliant at passing the ball forward with purpose and finding those players who are between the lines, I still don't see that from Declan Rice. And if I'm Pep Guardiola or Oli Gunnar Solskjaer looking for my next number six, who can really not just win the ball in midfield and carry the ball in midfield, but control a game in midfield, I don't think he's as good yet as Fernandinho or Fabinho um, in terms of passing the ball forward with purpose. Um, but he's still young. He can learn that. Um, but I think he's still a little bit short of that. And if you're going to spend £100 million on a holding midfielder, I want that from him now. Adam, I appreciate the compliment part. I'll buy you a box of chocolates as a gift. I'm definitely appreciate it, bro. <laughs> um, well, I'll start by saying Declan Rice is the real deal. He is the real deal. The young kids... We have a term right now called different gravy, and that is the best description right now for Declan Rice. 22, keeps getting better. The goal he scored against Dynamo Zagreb, absolutely brilliant solo run. He scored a similar goal against Southampton last season. In fact, he won a similar run against Leicester, which hit the crossbar. He has got his locker, but as I've touched on, the next step for Declan Rice right now is to score more goals. So last season, he scored two league goals in 32 league appearances. And as you as you mentioned, Adam, he cited the likes of Yaya Torre, Patrick Vieira, players who wants to try and emulate. And I think why I can get to that level. And I'm not sure if you can swear on this podcast, but it really pisses me off when I hear pundits say, ah, oh, play Declan Rice as centre-back. No, do you not play this guy as centre-back? Yes, he's good, he can play there, but he'll be so limited in terms of playing as centre-back. We've seen the, the, the transition he makes to trying to become more box-to-box midfielder. In my opinion, West Ham have one of the best midfield partnerships right now. And Thomas Sorchuk and Declan Rice, both so young, only a matter of time before both move to bigger clubs, unfortunately. But that's how it goes sometimes with West Ham. Like everything right now is, is heading in a good direction for Declan Rice. Is he worth 100 million? He is worth 100 million. That's how much he means to West Ham because he's that good. Generational talent. And listen, in I think it was February, Moises asked about during prior to the game against Leeds United, Rice's long term future was topic of, this, of, uh, of discussion. And Moyes said, listen, he's worth far, far more than 100 million. Far, far more than 100 million. And that was before he started in the Euros for England and before he won that brilliant solo run against Dynamo Zagreb. But he's worth that to West Ham. Is it, I, I don't think is he worth that to Manchester United or Manchester City? I can see a club paying the region of eighty, so sixty to eighty million for Declan Rice. I think that's realistic. If we're like you know all jokes aside, mm. I think I, I, I can see a club paying that much. And listen, that's people like people who cover West Ham, people are West Ham fans. Everyone's like, just don't go to Chelsea. You can go, but just don't go to Chelsea. So I think realistically, you're looking at Man City or Man United. Man City being Fernandinho in the last year, so he could be a long-term replacement. You're looking at Man United, I know they played reasonably good in midfield, but you've got Fred, there's still question marks over him. I think Scott McTominay is a really good player, so him and Rice could form a good partnership. I think realistically, those are two clubs that Rice could join next season. I, I wonder whether I wonder whether Rice and McTominay are a bit too similar. If you look at wanting to be that box-to-box the Aya Torre, Patrick Vieira figure, and and Manchester United are looking more for someone to to tick it over. I mean, ironically, the 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 best midfield pass between the lines yesterday was from Nemanja Matic, but Nemanja, Nemanja Matic hasn't got a long term future at, at, at Manchester United. So I do wonder whether whilst United, by all indications, like him and are looking at him. I do wonder whether he is a whether him and McTominay are a bit too similar. Yeah, and I don't, I, I totally understand what you're saying, Rashane, but I don't, I don't agree that he needs to score more goals, Declan Rice. You know, in the way that you have, to, you look at teams like Man City, Liverpool, 
Um, Chelsea now, they don't expect their holding midfielders to score goals. They don't really want their holding midfielders to drive beyond the, you know, beyond the attackers at times and things like that. I mean, that's quite a, it's an early 2000s thing that we'd expect from our midfielders. If I was Declan Rice, I'd be concentrating on getting my ball retention as good as possible and passing the ball with purpose forwards because that's what that's what you need. You know, he's he's brilliant at reading the game. He's really good at competing. But for him to go in as a number six at a, cha- a club that's in the Champions League, he needs to pass the ball and win the ball because the players in front of him will do that those bits that he's trying to to add to his game. I think, and if I'm Guardiola, Solskjaer, Tuchel, that's what I'm looking at from Declan Rice. I'm not worried if he's scoring five goals or ten goals. Yeah, Adam, and now I'm not so sure if I'm buying your chocolates, pal. You just, you just <laughs> broke my heart, mate. You, 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 you broke my heart now, Adam. But all, all jokes aside, I, I, I think Rice should look to score more goals. I really do, because let's say he joins a Champions League chasing team, right? We all know strikers get all the, all the headlines. But if you're a midfielder, you can add five or ten goals. Immediately, that sets you up a different level. And Rice has in his locker... Martin Keel said it in commentary last week, he's getting better and better. 22, no one there's prime. The scary thing with Declan Rice is, Lord knows how good he'll be when he's 27, 26. That's the scary thing about Declan Rice. Future England captain, in my opinion. And I think he's definitely capable of scoring more goals. He really is. He has that in his locker, driving runs, interceptions, good read of the game, only 22. It's just so scary in terms of Rice development. And us West Ham fans, right? We've sort of been a bit annoyed in the sense where well, I also play, well, I also have like one bad game for England. Everyone's like, oh, who's this guy? So rubbish. Why on earth is he worth 100 million? But if you watch the guy on a weekly basis, you see he just keeps improving, keeps playing, getting better. And he's got a great team he's working on doing David Moyes with culture stuff. Um, I'm not sure you're getting chocolates from me, Rashane, if you come on here quoting Martin Keown. Uh, so, <laughs> God love him. Um, um, uh, just, a, just a final one then on, on how West Ham view the Jesse Lingard situation. Well, I'll start by saying, as soon as Lingard went out to warm up, you just knew he was going to score the winning goal. You just mm. knew he was going to score the winning goal. But credit to Lingard because his celebration were rather subdued, so it shows how much respect he has for West Ham. Listen, the start's all along, but it's going to, it's going to be very unlikely for Lingard to rejoin West Ham. Oli got a social media that very clear to David Moyes that, listen, he still thinks he's part of his plans. Even for Lingard, he wants to stay at Main United in the fight for his place in the team. Yes, he had a great long spell at West Ham, scored nine goals in, four, in 16 league appearances. But ultimately... Is that a contract though this summer, Rashane? So they're just going to play the patient game, West Ham? Or yeah, do they, they, do they expect him to re-sign? I, I, I think, I personally believe he'll re-sign. He could play the patient game and wait till January. But when you think of someone like Lingard, even last season, he's got a young young daughter. And there were times last season when Moyes gave him an extra time to go back to Manchester, spend time with family. So that's also going to factor in his decision. So listen, it was great in terms of him playing for West Ham, got back into the England squad. But I think now Lingard's looking to, you know, stay at Man United and, you know, keep playing in their team. Adam? I, th- I mean, I think... If you'd have asked me, a bit like so many things, if you'd have asked me four days ago, I'd have said, you know, it's just a matter of time really before Lingard, <laughs> you know, leaves Man United because they've just got so many options. But actually, the more the more I think about it, when you have those players like Ronaldo and Pogba and Bruno, Sancho, Greenwood, Lingard offers something different in terms of he provides, you know, that sort of more selfless approach to forward play uh, the pressing, the running. And I think what you might see, particularly when Man United have a big run of games in October, November, where they play direct sort of top six rivals, I think Lingard will play quite a big part in those games because, you know, I mean, I watched Ronaldo closely yesterday live in the stadium and his, I mean, his movement is incredible in the penalty area, in the final third, unbelievable. But he doesn't do anything else. I mean, he really, really, and I'm not saying that as a criticism, he's conserving himself so that he can decide games um, in the right areas. But you're, you're carrying a player. And if you're carrying a player in that way, you then need people who are going above and beyond the usual expectations off the ball. And Jesse Lingard does that. And it's why, you know, when Man United played the first couple of games, Dan James was playing um, in those first few games. And that's because Solskjaer clearly wants that balance of players who are technically outstanding but also, physic- you know, you need players that have those physical attributes as well. And Lingard obviously has the technical side as well, as we saw with the goal. 